Every four years, the museum dedicates its space to presenting artists in the run-up to presidential elections who address some of the most contested issues facing voters. Our intention is to educate and provoke engagement in our civic life as we highlight the work of artists in our community. This year's election features six exhibitions and is titled Contested Space. Two exhibitions in this series are concerned with the weaponization of immigration policies. Uh, one, one of the artists uh, was Alan Gerson. Uh, he was a photographer and human rights attorney who uh, made mural sized photographs that make us witnesses to the perilous journey of individuals in Mexico, dreaming of life on the other side of the US border wall, risking everything to cross over. Uh, the other exhibition is, of course, Mikre Pita's work, which addresses the environmental and human aspect of Chinese immigration into the Uyghur territory. Uh, drawing upon her ancestry, she contemplates the loss of Uyghur cultural identity and the ongoing worldwide refugee crisis. I'm pleased to welcome Mikre Pita and the curator of her exhibition, John Blee. John writes for On Art for the George Towner here in Washington, D.C and teaches at the Art League in Alexandria. But John is first and foremost an artist. In fact, I gave John a show in my art gallery almost 40 years ago. His paintings were then and still are perfectly at the intersection of color and spirituality, inspired by his childhood growing up in India and Pakistan. Thank you, Mikre Pita and John Blee for joining us. For me, art is like meditation and the kind of space can be very big if you can get into it. born in the Kashgar in the Uyghur region of West China and grew up in the city of Urumqi. After I graduated from the Art Institute there, I moved to the Beijing to work uh, as a professional artist. During China's opening up period, and uh, I was able to travel to Europe and the US. Mikre, what uh, was your early work like? Uh, I know I've seen it, so I know it's very different, but what is, was it influenced by? How did you come to it? And uh, where, I mean, in other words, what is the origin of your art? Uh, my early paintings uh, were influenced by uh, my study of Cezanne and Expressionism and Serialism. And, and, uh, and after I moved to the U.S. in 2005, and my work began to change. It took a more uh, contemporary look, and I had a deeper thoughts about uh, space and life. Uh, because of the open space and the freedom of the countries, uh, country, and uh, I was able to uh, develop a more quiet mind. And after that, you... Um began to change the, not just the um, way you were painting, but also the focus of your art, which has to do with several issues um, involving the space that is vanishing in the world. Um, and uh, did, did this have any relation or connection to your exposure to the Uyghur region uh, caves? which yeah. you saw when you were eight around 18 right that was uh, where you spent about a week there studying in, there. in a college in a college uh mm -hmm. in the college i spent some time in the Kuzil caves uh in the uyghur region of kuchar uh, this uyghur cave art was uh, from the third to uh, eighth centuries and uh, contained the wealth of buddhist images uh, for example, uh, some Buddhas with wings, uh, we can also see a connection between the Tarim Basin and the city of Rome. 
and the, mm -hmm. the blue color used in the cave paintings is the same as the early Italian artists used. At the Matisse Museum in the Nice in France, I saw similarity to the cave art. I almost feel as uh, if Matisse borrowed the idea from the Uyghurs. Uh, we, also can, we also see many religions in Uyghur lands at that time. And uh, uh, great tolerance of other culture than perhaps we see today. It was also worth mentioning, I mean, I'm sure Edward's going to talk about it, the uh, Silk Route and all that came through that area. So the Uyghur region was not isolated in terms of the world. It also had other influences coming through. And of course, uh, the Indian uh, influence in the caves. So uh, what, do you have influences in your early uh, life and so on that is, uh, that is present in the work you're painting today? Uh, so I, I think I have always felt uh, a deep connection with the ancient Uyghur culture, and, uh, but I couldn't always say how and why. At the same time, uh, my experience uh, affect my work. And I can see that uh, most of the things happening this age uh, don't make sense, uh, don't make much, uh, make much sense. Uh, this include uh, immigrants and refugees, uh, which are now a global issue. How do, and how did the, uh, when you saw Western art for the first time, it would have been in, in Beijing, some of it, or, or was it not until you got to Europe? When you were in Beijing, you went to uh, Italy, I think, and uh, did that change? Uh, what changed your sort of relationship to yourself as an artist in the world? Was it that trip to Europe or was it before then? I think the trip to Europe, that's uh, changed a lot, my traveling, in Europe and, and the US. I mm -hmm. came to the US before, you know, up, right after the Europe in 2000, then I, but I moved to the US on 2005. Mm -hmm. And how did, how did the, uh, were there particular artists that spoke to you uh, at that time or was it just the work in general that you saw? Yeah, I think that in Beijing, you know, this started in Beijing also, and uh, during China's opening up period, uh, uh, the contemporary just introduced to Beijing, especially in Beijing, and uh, so, and uh, that I saw a political art on display at, at the underground exhibitions. I also had a uh, solo show, uh, it's not underground, it's above ground. And my paintings of uh, that time seems uh, to address the uh, Uyghur situation. And in China, I got a very close uh, look at how the population affect the environment. And uh, I saw how it has uh, direct connection with uh, other disaster of our time. And such as the refugees, and this has a direct connection with the number of immigrants. And uh, so when you're painting your work, do you have thematic things that you're working through? I mean, you put many, many symbols of uh, people in them. For instance, this is a crowded field. I mean, the thing that's interesting about your work is the field is empty, but it's filled with uh, this symbolic presence of people. So it's like you're, and the emptiness behind it uh, is very impressive to me. I remember when I first saw the work, uh, it didn't look like anyone else. And it, uh, although I can, it could intuit the um, political message, it wasn't, you didn't make it absolutely explicit, but it became, implicit through or explicit through talking to me with you further and looking more at your work. So when you paint, are you thinking about those issues or it's just something that's natural to you? Um, how does that work in your process? Yeah, I think uh, to me, it's something like natural to me. 
like uh, you said, uh, I think this uh, experience, all my background, and uh, really affects my work. I uh, think that the space in your work is unique. And I mean, I immediately thought once I saw the, the work about the um, cave art, because I'm familiar with it in India. It came from India up there through Buddhism, through the spread of Buddhism. But that emptiness, is that something that the spatial feeling, is it new in yourself in the last 20 years? Or is that something you've felt since you were a child? Or how, you know, the, the space that's in your work, is it something you finally got to now? Or was it always present in your work? Or I, I don't see it so much in your early work, which is more. Yeah, I think the kind of spiritual influence I got uh, from this, uh, the background I come from, and uh, like uh, what I imagined at the beginning of the cave art, and uh, this, uh, this all impact my work, I think. And the move to the U.S., you know, from China and uh, to here, there's more open space. Uh, this all affected, I, I think. What do you think people have lost uh, in uh, modern life? Uh, it's, uh, it seems that I always look uh, for space in my life. And maybe this uh, is connected to my moving to the U.S. Uh, whenever I look at my earlier paintings, uh, I find that I was indeed looking for space, and uh, but I couldn't find it, and uh, that was uh, tied to the population, tied to population there. People were losing their space and everything else. You know, sometimes when you meet someone, a painter or any kind of artist, their work seems divorced from them. You know, it's like something they do. With you, I feel your work is very much congruent with you. It's the same as you. I don't find when I speak to you, I'm speaking to someone uh, else other than the person who paints your work. So I think it's very much out of you. And I think that's part of the power, or certainly that's the power of it as well. So it's not something you've just thought of it up. It's something you've achieved. So, yeah, in the, yeah, in in this new country, I I began to uh, I began think uh, thinking about uh, who I was and who we are. This has affected my work, and I have found a spiritual space in my painting. It definitely has a spiritual space. Definitely meditational. I agree with you, and you no, know, it's something I see uh, feel every time I see your work. So, and I think it's unique in your work as well. that uh, we are going to be joined by Edward Lutbach. Uh, he's going to help us dig a little deeper into the cultural context of Mikre's work. Uh, Edward has been described by The Guardian as the Machiavelli of Maryland, military strategist, classical scholar, cattle rancher, and an advisor to presidents, prime ministers, and the Dalai Lama. It was Edward who first persuaded me to mount a show of Mikre Pita's work. And I always listen to Edward. I seldom agree with him, but I always listen to him. He is always provocative and informed, and I'm sure he won't let us down today. Uh, Edward, uh, thanks so much for being here to talk about Mikre. You're very kind. So my encounter with the Uyghur occurred a very long time ago uh, when I visited Xinjiang. Um, possibly the very first group of people who did visit Xinjiang uh, after the installation of communism. Um, and I encountered the Uyghur. The 
Uyghur, there are in that area, there are Kazakhs and there are Kyrgyz and there are Mongols and uh, lesser groups of Tajiks and so on. But the Uyghur stood out because um, their identity was urban. In fact, their country was called Five Cities uh, in, you know, Besh, Besh, Five, Five Cities. So urban means literate. And they have been literate uh, in through, now literate would be in Arabic when they became Muslim later on. But before that, they were an historian Christian and therefore used an historian alphabet, which happens to be the Hebrew alphabet, so that I was able to read very easily in historian writings, written much in the same way that Israeli housewives put on their fridges notes to themselves about shopping, the very same script. And, be, and as Mikre mentioned, of course, before they were Muslim, before the, the Nestorian presence, they were Buddhists. Now, as you know, the Mongols are Buddhist, and so it is that to this day, when you are visiting Beijing and you look up to the shields which decorate the most important monuments, they are written, they are not only Chinese characters, but they are Mongol characters. And the Mongol characters is the old Uyghur alphabet derived from the Nestorians, which they got it from the Hebrew. And it's also written, in addition to Mongol, Manju, the Qing dynasty, Manju, Jurchen. Their uh, alphabet was also derived from the Uyghur. So what the, for the Chinese, this creates a number of problems. First, the Uyghur are the dominant nationality in Xinjiang, which is a great big part of the whole of China. It was never part of historic China, but it was conquered by the Manchu. The Manchu conquered both China and Xinjiang and Mongolia, like the British would conquer India and Sri Lanka. And what's happened now is that the citizens of Sri Lanka claimed to rule India because they were both under British rule. So the Manju left, gone, and the Uyghur found themselves uh, captured, as it were, by the Han Chinese who inherited the Manju heritage when the dynasty fell in 1913, lost it again, and got it back because of the American victory over Japan. The American victory over Japan established the borders of China as the old Manju borders which the Chinese were never able to retain. They lost control. They lost Manchuria to the Japanese, Mongolia became independent, and Xinjiang was independent. So Mikre, just a few years before Mikre was born in historic terms, she's terribly young, but just a few years before that, it was an independent state. It was East Turkestan. And what was inside East Turkestan? So this is all a big problem for the Chinese because their possession of Xinjiang is illegitimate. It's very dubious. It was given to them for the fact that the Americans invented the atom bomb, defeated Japan, and they got it as a gift, in effect. The second problem they have is that when the Han Chinese approach one of the 35, 36 recognized national minorities, they are approaching with all the Chinese literacy, their books, their culture, everything they have, and they're approaching guys who have funny hats. You know, the, many of these cultures don't have much literacy, they have funny hats. When they approach the Uyghur, on the other hand, they're approaching a group which has been literate for many centuries, which determine the culture very heavy on the Mongols and the Manchurians themselves who ruled China, and whose Buddhist core includes the thing that Mikre found in the caves and found in the Matisse Museum for a very good reason, because this is the Buddhist art that came up historically from Peshawar, now a savage place, but then a great Buddhist capital, where the Greek artists from the Alexandrian conquest, from the Greco-Indian or Greco-Afghani kingdoms and some entered. So the reason why Matisse and the caves have something in common is because they both have 
this fundamental Greek underline. When you visit the Buddhist museum in Peshawar, now locked and closed, the key man will open it for you if you bribe him. It's, it's locked to protect it. It's locked to protect it from all the people in Peshawar that would destroy these effigies of men and women. So you go there, what you're seeing is the great Buddhist art, which was the fusion of Indian with Greek, which was achieved by the Macedonians. And that stuff traveled straight up the caravan route, straight up to the caves that Mikre visited, in which I visited the first time in 1976. I then found them in a bad condition. Then I visited them after the Cultural Revolution. I saw them only after the Cultural Revolution had led to a lot of vandalism. There was a little bit of restoration on my next visit, and there it is. So what we have here is that the possession of culture, the possession of art, is something that is, I think, a kind of richness that people like Mikre have from it. And it's also the reason why the Chinese are so particularly infuriated by the Uyghurs, because the Chinese are now preventing the Mongols from studying in their own language. They are trying, of course, they've been trying forever to suppress Tibetan culture, but it's the Uyghur culture that really they want to extinguish. And what they're doing now in Xinjiang, as you know, is that they're killing hardly anybody. They're imprisoning people and then releasing them if they appear to be on good behavior and then rearresting them. But what they're really trying to do is something that is really unique in history. They are not trying to kill them. They're trying to turn them into Chinese. They want children, Uyghur children in Xinjiang, not to know Uyghur and to be Chinese speakers, Chinese writers. And, you know, in that way, they can be absorbed. Uh, this is the latest twist. Xi Jinping's twist is not repression, oppression, persecution. No, it's signification. They want to empty them out and turn them into Chinese, who look slightly different. Uh, and they're doing this very vigorously. And they're having a lot of problems because of the internalized culture of the Uyghur. One of the, I'll finish by saying that back then in 1976, uh, the, I was traveling, of course, with these uh, keepers, mentors, and from the Chinese foreign ministry, uh, people who were horrified when I took out the eye of a baked sheep from the Kazakhs, uh, Kazakh encampment and offered the eye to them because there are all these urban Beijing people and stuff. But when I, when I did that, they did take me to a concert. And what I noticed in the concert is that everybody in the concert behaved as if I thought I was in Vienna Philharmonic or something, because it was somebody playing the dutar, the dutar, which is the, the two string instrument that makes many different kinds of wonderful sounds with people of very high skill, very demanding instrument. There was a dutar player, and the people, instead of, you know, listening to him like, uh, they would listen to him in a very rigid pose of people who are truly attentive to the fine touches of the music. In other words, there is serious culture there. There are herdsmen, primitive herdsmen, can't read and write. There are farmers who are very little, but there was also the five towns, the five towns. That's a, and there is a, something that, I think it's really rather wonderful that Mikre Pida should have rescued the artistic aspect of this culture and brought the piece of it forward. That's why I'm quite enthusiastic about this and I'm very grateful to Jack to have picked up the opportunity and the museum for doing it. it this is something quite important in, in my view. Thank you, Edward. That was, uh, that was quite an amazing, uh, recounting, and uh, I don't think I'll argue with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I better. Uh, thanks so much for being here, and thank you, Mikre, and thank you, John, uh, for a wonderful program.